And so here we go. And so that, you know, clearly we have a problem with breast cancer, and now we have a multiparametric genetic assay to maybe help us figure that out one way or the other. And so the question is we have a bunch of genetic tests right now, or multiparametric tests, like PAM50, like EndoPredict, uh, like the Breast Cancer Index. Um, and I think right now the question, you know, which have the potential, at least at San Antonio a couple years ago, this was presented, I think about a year and a half ago, um, that BCI, that the Breast Cancer Index, seems to be able to predict at least uh, between the benefit of five years versus ten of tamoxifen, and even potentially the benefit of five years of aromatase inhibitor after five years of tamoxifen. I mean, what do people think of that data? Uh, do you want to talk about BCI? Do you understand what BCI is, Denise? Yeah, I think um, the Breast Cancer Index has rolled out as one way to help us navigate through this extended endocrine therapy, and I certainly have used it in my practice for selected patients. I think, you know, when I look at that data, um, and I think you know, as Joyce was saying, trying to really select out who are those patients that benefit from the extended um, endocrine therapy, you know, the, the absolute benefit, still three to six percent. Um, and so for any given patient, some patient's not tolerating that, some patient is ready when that fifth year comes to mark it off their calendar, and then I have other patients who are very reluctant to come off of their therapy before the Atlas and Adam data. So, you know, when I look through my practice, um, I have start having these discussions for, with patients as they approach their fourth year and talk about the Atlas and Adam data that wasn't there when they were uh, initially diagnosed and embarked on their endocrine therapy. Um, and for some patients, they get a lot of pushback that they uh, do not want to, you know, do prolonged therapy. They're having side effects. Um, for some patients, it's a peace of mind to know um, as they move forward in the years 5 through 10 that there is another tool that suggests that they may benefit. Um, and so for those patients, I, I do it. I, I think the interesting group that I've just slowly been um, looking at are the patients that are HER2 positive. And I think a little different from the oncotype group where HER2 positive um, almost uniformly gives you a, a high oncotype score, that doesn't seem to be the case for BCI. So it is able to help segregate out a lower risk HER2 positive hormone receptor positive patient. I think uh, it's important to keep in mind that when we look at extended uh, hormonal therapy, uh, the, the, obviously the patients at higher risk are also going to be the ones that derive a greater benefit. And you can use just standard stage, node positive, uh, or you can use uh, molecular indices. Uh, the, the, the BCI is, is one that is the only one that's actually been tested specifically in an extended right. hormonal, randomized hormonal uh, study. So I think that one is the one that has the greatest promise. Uh, at our institution, we're actually going to do a validating study with uh, our uh, clinical and tissue uh, data set to see if we can uh, also uh, use that to identify who, who benefits uh, in terms of outcomes. Uh, so, you know, I think that. Um, uh, it does increase the risk uh, to keep someone on longer hormonal therapy. We know that with tamoxifen, for example, the, the risk of uterine deaths from uterine cancer is double when you use uh, uh, longer therapy. And I suspect as we get more data from the extended AI trials, we'll find toxicities as well. So it's going to be very critical that we try to measure the quantitative benefits and quantitative harms. Yeah, I just want to like, touch on, before we go back to BCI, uh, something that Denise said. You know, it turns out, yes, most of the HER2 positive early stage breast cancers that we test are HER2 are, are high or at least high intermediate oncotype. But when you look at some of the other assays, you know, such as the mammoprint, the 70 gene assay, BCI, you don't see that. You see maybe 20% of those HER2, those triple positives, actually turn out to be low risk. You know, what do you guys think of that? Do you use any of those assays now, right now? I've always asked, I asked this the last time we did this. I'm just curious if people have changed. So, so we've looked at the Oncotype DX and it didn't help us predict the outcome in the right. setting of her positive breast cancer. The manuscript is uh, currently uh, hopefully published, being published very, very soon. But uh -huh. well, that's why we've been so interested in investigating whole genome analysis uh, to really offer predictability in the setting of her positive uh, directed therapy. Uh, because I think the, the markers that we've had so far have not been good enough in that subset of patients. But, I mean, there is some retrospective data from uh, Mammoprint from, that actually does show. It's retrospective data, obviously, and it's case series. You know, you've got to take that for what it's worth. You know, but it clearly shows about 15 to 20 percent 
of triple positive breast cancer, ER positive, HER2 <coughs> positive, PR positive, actually has a survival on the low oncotype, a low mammoprint of like 95% at 10 years. So there are people, there are patients with HER2 positive disease who are going to do very well. Yeah, and we, we've detected that in the sisters registry where we've looked at patients with metastatic HER2 positive disease, and there's a group of them that when they had early stage disease, had a very long disease-free interval before they recurred, and then there's a whole other group that had very short disease-free intervals. So there is a spectrum of there's biology there. there. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, but, but if I may, just to clarify that we're not recommending or endorsing no. the use of any of this mama print or PAM50 no, right now. we're just talking about it. Right. Just yeah, talking no, no, about no, it. Yeah, no, yeah. Edith, I know you're conservative in this. Yeah. I've known you for many but it years. Is, I know that. It is yeah. important yeah. to recognize yeah. that they do look at different things. Not all of the, pro you know, a lot of the prognostic indicators are mostly in the first five years, and others specifically do look at later recurrences. So as the data comes out, you really have to look at it specifically for what you're trying to achieve. So yeah, we have a hardcore molecular biologist at the uh, side. Yeah, so what do you think of all this? What do you think of all this? I mean, what do you think of these tests? No, I'm just stimulated by the fact that you said that there's some tumors, triple positives, that behave like low-grade ER positives. I mm -hmm. always thought that HER2 was the big gorilla. But the, and the, the ER was kind of the bridesmaid, but what yeah. you're saying is they may be the other way around. It's not always yeah. the driver. I don't so. think it's always the driver. <laughs> yeah, usually is. Some that usually is. is. And the challenge, I think, for clinically, again, we don't know this yet, obviously, Edith, with all due respect to the, to the we don't know yet who that 20%, 15% of the triple positives are. I wish we did. Working you know. on that. Yeah, I know. Surely. I wish we did. <laughs> so, okay, but back to BCI for a minute, just so we can close this out. Um, I think that, you know, it, it seems it is the only test right now. I mean, we do have data from PAM50. Um, that does show, you know, clearly shows the prognostability of these between years five and ten. But the BCI seems to be the one, at least right now, uh, that potentially, you know, if you're going to do this with all the caveats we said, it seems like to be one that we would kind of use. Um, but do you think you would use, someone comes in on five years of AI, do you think we're okay with the data we have now to be able to use this for AIs? I know there's some data that's being presented at this ASCO school about that. Would you, anybody do that? Would you, use, would you use this for AIs? Would you restrict the use of BCI just to tamoxifen? It, it really depends on what the data shows because I'd first want to know what is the benefit from five versus ten years of AI? What are the harms? Right. And then I would like to know how the prognostic factors help us then get absolute benefits and harms because that's what it's all about. Every medical decision is right. balancing the absolute benefits against the absolute harms as much as you can tailor it, individualize it for that patient. Fair enough. Okay. All right, so let's move on uh, to uh, one last thing, actually, in the ER positive realm before we go on to uh, other things. Actually, there's a few more things to talk about. Um, how do people feel about the soft data that's come out? Are you now putting all women on LHRH agonists and AI? Edith? Yeah, I mean, uh, soft was truly, you know, a labor of love, if I may say, you know, a global <laughs> trial that took a long time. It was conducted, you know, parallel to the text trial. There were separate manuscripts published in the New England Journal of Medicine. But essentially what the soft trial demonstrated is that uh, th there was no statistical improvement of uh, recommending LHRH uh, agonist slash antagonist with antiestrogen versus the antiestrogen alone, which was tamoxifen. So that was the primary result of the overall trial. Then in subset analysis, for the patients in whom the medical oncologist felt that they could benefit from chemotherapy, then there was a, an advantage to those patients having received LHRH agonist plus uh, tamoxifen or an AI versus uh, the tamoxifen. So this was one of the studies that was negative overall, but with a subset of patients that appeared to benefit. So I would uh, consider counseling the patients based on, on what we found in the clinical trial. So, and, but would you, I guess, so that's one, would everybody tend to agree with that? I, I think this is a tough issue because we normally don't uh, base our therapies on subset analysis, but this is a little bit different. Not yeah. only was it a very large study with uh, pretty uh, uh, convincing evidence among the subsets, but we've seen this before in the intergroup trial, in the ZIP trial. Uh, these are studies that were also negative with respect to uh, ophorectomy plus or minus uh, ovarian ablation, yet uh, we're consistently seeing this. So my, I have actually counseled my patients that I believe are high risk, who are uh, premenopausal, uh, that ovarian blockade could, in their situation, uh, improve their outcomes. And um, it's one of the few situations where I think a subset analysis uh, is something that you can actually use in practice. Uh, there are not many of them, but I think this is one of them. One thing there was to realize that there were significant toxicities associated yes, with inducing absolutely. ovarian function suppression 
that also, of course, you're including in the discussion with patients, but it's good for everybody to remember that aspect. But and one thing I'll add about the toxicities, they tended to be short-term. If you followed them out, the differences in the quality of life did t seem to start to come together over time. Yeah. But we need, we need more follow-up on that. I, I tend to agree with Deb also. I think that also this makes biological sense <laughs> that women, that, you know, that they regain ovarian function so you know that in those women, tamoxifen may not be able, may not be able to block ER completely. So it makes sense to add, uh, to do a, a total estrogen blockade. This is very reminiscent of the trial, that the SWOG study, that useful Vestrant and, and uh, Arimidex. And again, uh, it's something that in prostate cancer has been done, the total androgen blockade, but we have never done it formally in, in breast cancer. The but this kind of makes sense to me. Yeah. Again, for that young patient that was considered to be eligible for chemo and then regain ovarian function that is under 35 or 40. The question I have though, and again, back to toxicity, and I think it's a question that people in the community have all the time. Do you have to use an aromatase inhibitor? Can you do LHR with TAM? A That's lot of question. people have interpreted soft, yeah. if I'm not mistaken, yeah as saying you must use LHRH with an AI. No, 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 yeah. no TAM is a very good, um, and frankly, it's, it's sometimes the only practical way to go. It's just a little too much to do an LHRH agonist and an AI out of the starting gates. Um, it's probably very analogous to what we do in the um, postmenopausal women. We tend to use the aromatase inhibitors for the very heavily tumor burden, more highly proliferative, because those curves split early, you know, so obviously those are your fast-growing cancers that are um, recurring on tamoxifen. So I really only go with the AI in the most high risk situation. Otherwise, I let the woman have a little chance to uh, adjust to going down on the LHRH agonist. A lot of them will choose to go on to BSO if they've already finished childbearing. Let them um, equalize, you know, equilibrate on tamoxifen for a couple years and then switch them over unless they've got very, very, you know, very highly proliferative, heavy tumor burdened cancer, in which case you know, obviously they're at high risk and they've just got to get onto the AI. So I, I individualize as much as I do in the postmenopausal setting. Study. Mm -hmm. And one question about the other, the other side of it is, what's the proper LHRH suppression? One question people had when they saw the soft data, and I don't know, Edith, maybe you can answer this, is was there a difference in prognosis based on the type of LHRH suppression? In other words, a, you know, luprolide versus an oophorectomy? Did people look at that data? Uh, of course, uh, okay, yes. Uh, but you know, the, the manuscripts really have to come out related okay. to the regaining of uh, menses in, in, or the change in hormonal levels in patients who were getting LHRH agonists because it, it may be surprising to realize that they don't work 100% on everybody. <laughs> that's the, that was my point. That's exactly the point. And yeah. I think that, you know, that's why, I mean, that may explain an old, you know, an old piece of data from ABCSG12. Correct. Where LHRH and AI was worse mm -hmm. than LHRH and TAM, mm -hmm. you know, but we're trying to reconcile that now with soft. Right. You know, that's mm -hmm. kind of the problem. Yeah. So let's move on.